Well, hello, and thank you for taking the time to join us uh, to watch a video here that we haven't had to do in quite a while. We feel that uh, with the rising cases that we're seeing with COVID-19, especially through the city utilities workforce, we wanna take a time to address some of your questions and concerns, and especially talk about vaccinations and, and see exactly where we stand with that as a company, where we stand with that as a community, and even as, as a state. So things are changing rather rapidly here, especially with COVID-19, looking at the Delta variants. Um, yesterday alone, we had 854 new cases in Missouri. 124 of those are in intensive care. So we're starting to see such a, a, an alarming rise on this that we wanna make sure we get you the proper information you need to know to make some very important decisions. Joining us today, uh, as always, is Gary Gibson, our president and CEO, and Steve Edwards with Cox Health, the president and CEO of, of that organization is taking the time to visit with us today on this uh, very important topic. Um, Gary, let's just start with you. The main reason we're doing this is we're very concerned about the cases we're seeing rise, uh, and it's particularly in some of our work areas. Can you kind of go into that and tell us a little bit of what we're seeing with some specifics there? Yeah, thanks, Joel. And, and thanks, Steve, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate your leadership over the last 16 months uh, in the community, and I really appreciate everything your teams have, have done to help support our community. I, I'm sure you're like me. There hasn't been a day over the last 16, 17 months that, that I haven't spent a big chunk of my day thinking about keeping everybody safe and, and what we could do to support all my coworkers and what our jobs are to support the community. And I think we've navigated this thing pretty well, but we can always do better. And I'm really concerned with what we have seen over the last two weeks. Uh, it really shows with this Delta variant and if we let our guard down, how quickly uh, this could spread through a work group. Uh, if you haven't heard already, we had a real surge in our power generation group at JTEC. Uh, as of this morning, and uh, we actually have several employees that have got back to work, so the numbers look better than they actually were. Uh, but as of this morning, we have nine employees who have tested positive for COVID, and we have five more who are out on quarantine. But out of those nine, uh, Four of our co-workers are extremely ill uh, and hospitalized. It really shows how quickly something can spread through a group. So why this is being contained to JTEC, what I've been saying all along, and the only way I see an end to this thing is to get rid of that tender for the fire. The only way I knew that, know how to get there is through vaccinations. And as a company, we've reached about just a slightly over 45% vaccinated, but, uh, a lot of that is primarily in the office environment. I know a lot of our operating groups are a lot lower rates than that. And when I talk to you, you know, I hear a lot of concerns that you have, and that's why we've asked Steve to come today to kind of help address some of those concerns and answer some of your questions. So really appreciate your time, Steve. Thank you, Gary. Steve, let, let's just jump right into this. You've been on the forefront of, of this COVID situation for 16 months. And here in the last couple of weeks, Springfield has come unfortunately to the forefront of the attention of the nation again. Uh, do you see any reason why that's happening in our area and, and just some insight into that maybe? Yeah, I think, I think that we are um, seeing a different approach to this disease in the, in the first couple of ways where we saw it hit the coast and work its way to the Midwest. And that time um, that it took to spread to the Midwest, we took advantage of, we were able to prepare more in the Midwest. I think we reduced some of the mortality. If you remember the early days in New York City before we understood the disease, how, how much mortality there was, um, it's it far better results here. However, I think the Delta variant um, is starting from the inside out. And uh, maybe the Ozarks are the epicenter when you look at the data. It's not new information to us. We know the Delta variant in the United Kingdom um, was doubling um, the percentage of, of people that were testing for it. Um, about five to six weeks, it went from the first discovery to about 99%. We saw the same thing here. So it's a Delta variant. And then add on that, uh, maybe the, um, the, the tender that Gary described is those of us that not, might not be vaccinated that are vulnerable. Um, and so we have vaccination rates as low as 35% or in some counties in the teens, you're gonna have this disease spread and spread rapidly. That's when the challenge of the hospital is it spread so much more quickly than the first waves. And so our ability to ramp up and prepare for it um, has been different. 
Um, but by comparison, I was talking to Dr. John Lynch, who's an ID doc in the Seattle area. We were talking to him, and they have a less than 1% positivity rate. Um, ours is 32.1 right now of those tested are positive with symptoms. And in his zip code, 93% of his community is vaccinated. So 93% vaccinated, less than 1% positive. We are 35% vaccinated and as today, 33 plus percent symptomatic positivity. So it's just the reverse and it's a, it's a disease that spreads um, by human behavior. We, we've learned how to mitigate it and um, not only masking, distancing, but more importantly, the vaccine can mitigate it. So that's why it's spreading, we think, and it's gonna spread, I think, throughout the South and Midwest. Um, we are a harbinger for the rest of the rest of the country with it. And it's a different disease. We're seeing much um, more rapid decline, less predictable um, in terms of who's declining and, um, and younger people that are sicker in the hospital. We talked about the numbers with Gary just a minute ago about what we're seeing here right at CU within our workforce. Can you address just a little bit, Steve, what we're seeing in the Springfield area with the patients that Cox is seeing and maybe that, that Mercy, your, your uh, cohort across town is seeing and just in our area in general? I know you said the, the variant is stronger and it's more rapidly spreading, um, but what are you seeing that number-wise? Yeah, so I mean, both Cox and Mercy have real similar numbers. I, I think we're both sitting around 100 patients in, in the hospital right now. Now, six weeks ago, we were at 14. Um, we, uh, yesterday, I know, for example, we had four pediatric cases in the hospital due to COVID. Every once in a while, you'd have a, you know, someone who has a, a, you know, appendicitis or something, and they test positive for COVID, but these, all four of these were positive for COVID, and that was the reason they're in the hospital, from a patient less than two weeks old to 18 years old. So it's a different disease um, than the original wild strain. Um, to give you a reference point, the original wild strain, there's a number called the r naught. that's a transmissibility. Many of you probably heard that number early on. And the, the original strain is thought to be 2.5 r naught, meaning if I got it, I would likely give it to two and a half people. They would give it to two and a half people. Um, the Delta variant is thought to have a r naught transmissibility of six to eight. So think of the logarithmic difference. If I get it, I give it to eight. Those eight people give it to eight. And that's why we're seeing it spread so quickly, despite having vaccination rates. Now, the good news is we have very few elderly people in the hospital now. The vaccination rates are above 80%. The nursing homes have managed it well. The average age of our admission has gone down 12 years since the beginning of this pandemic. And so we're seeing it affect younger people. And I think it's not just because of vaccination. I think it's a different disease and that's affecting young people more. That just reinforces the importance of being vaccinated and, and how critical that is to not only our area, but as Governor Parson came out yesterday, uh, urging people within our state to consider if you haven't already becoming vaccinated. Um, along with that, we hear quite often the comments that there's not enough known about the vaccine. How was it developed so rapidly? Why? Just so many questions out there. Any thoughts on that as to how to relieve some of the skepticism on that and some of the concerns that the folks have, especially as you were indicating um, the younger population where we're seeing such a surge there. Right. I think we've, we've all realized a couple of things that the mRNA vaccine technology isn't brand new. Um, it's been around 20 plus years. It's been, it's been applied already to certain kind of cancer type patients with some success. We've never had a reason um, to produce this um, uh, mRNA for this, this type of for SARS-CoV-2, right? And so it, the technology was geared up um, and ready to go, but only really after 20 years of, of development and research. Um, also importantly understand that in the clinical trials, it went through all three phases of clinical trials. What they did differently this time is they carved out a lot of the administrative um, duplication. So for example, they would do a, a set through phase one and phase two concurrently. Um, and so we we're able to multiply the ability to go through um, this in a more rapid approach. The other thing I would note is um, I don't think ever in the history of man have we given so many doses of a vaccine. Um, I know last count we we're above 2.4 billion doses of the vaccine administered. And if you get the vaccine, you'll remember that there is a, um, a code that you can uh, turn in if you've had any kind of reactions. 
So we developed a database on this vaccine that is unmatched anywhere in the history of vaccines. We are hoping for efficacy of 40 to 60 percent, which is along the lines of the flu vaccine. And uh, data recently out of Israel um, is showing uh, efficacy still 94, 95 percent, but more importantly, 99 percent in, in that range for severe disease. So what's going to happen? People are still going to test positive. Um, we get that. We get five or 10 positives a day for people vaccinated, but they generally don't even know they're positive. They're asymptomatic. At worst, they have cold like symptoms. Um, we've had, I think, four patients hospitalized with COVID pneumonia who are vaccinated out of almost 4,000. Um, of course, the first big part, the vaccine wasn't available. But those patients in almost every circumstance had a very severely weakened immune system. And we also know the data says that while it's highly effective against severe, severe disease, maybe 98 to 99 percent, that still means there's going to be one or two um, percent that could still get severe disease. I liken it to someone saying, boy, they got vaccinated and um, they still got sick, it must not work. And I compare that to before we had seat belts. And if someone wears a seat belt and 98% of the people that were being killed aren't killed and 2% um, uh, still die, uh, it doesn't mean seat belts don't work. It means they're 98% effective. So that's the, the metaphor I guess I would share. Uh, the safety data uh, in the history of vaccines um, the safety issues are around the first six weeks. Um, that's, it's never been different than that. Um, well, we know for sure, I guess there's always that risk. Um, we would be very candid. There's some risk, but the risk of COVID related illness and the long-term effect and the mortality far outweighs the risk. So that's why I know at Cox more than 90, 95 or so percent of our doctors are vaccinated. Um, and I remind people, you know, if you get sick, um, you want to talk to your oncologist if you have cancer. Um, you don't want to talk to Facebook. You don't want to talk to that guy down the street. You want to talk to your doctor. And so as you're struggling for advice, with all the information, it's very confusing and overwhelming because there's it's, it's strong opinions on both sides. Um, I encourage you to try to wipe out both sides of the argument and go to the person or people that you think you trust, that care for your health, that have expertise, most likely your primary care doctor, and get advice from them. That's, that's my, my advice to anyone. And, and for the rest of us who have the vaccine, try not to judge, try to understand, um, give people grace. It's really confusing and um, we get that. Um, but at this point as a public health official, um, I, I think everyone we vaccinate is, is someone that will not be in our ICU. So it's important to me to vaccinate as many as we can. So thanks, Steve. What, what I, so I think you kind of told me something that, that when I talk to people around the company that are they're hesitant, you know, I hear some of those same things. Well, I'm hesitant because this thing was really rushed through or it wasn't FDA approved. And what I'm hearing you say is that's not really the case. It was really more the administrative stuff that w was cut out. And I really like what you said about going to the source as far as trusted information, because I know there's a lot of different information out there. Is there any place other than a primary, uh, primary care physician uh, that somebody could get good peer-reviewed information, you know, as, as a website, or, or where would you send them to other than just reading comments on Facebook? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I've, I found out throughout the pandemic, I rarely watch cable news. Um, and, and then I'd hear these conspiracy theories and I'd turn on the TV, I'm like, oh, that's where it came from. Um, of course, you know, I'm surrounded by physician experts and um, not, not only the articles I find, but they're, they're giving me the right information. So you look for these trusted medical journals or at least quotes from those medical journals. So we look at, you know, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, we look at the infectious disease group, um, MM, MMWR. Um, those, are, those are trusted sources. Remember, it's a novel disease. Our information is evolving. What we know today compared to March of 20 is far different. Um, we've actually learned how to manage this disease. Um, but uh, I, I think they're, you know, not all of us are trained and prepared to understand, you know, Poisson distributions in England Journal of Medicine. So I get that's, that's overwhelming. Um, but I, I would really discourage you, whether, whether your political leanings are left or right, um, both, both cable um, political vent, uh, angles seem to lend toward extremism, um, whether it's left leaning or right leaning. And I, I try to dismiss that information and go to trusted sources, peer-reviewed, published articles. 
And when you do that, also understand that a published article from a year ago is out of date. And so some people will quote, quote articles that are old that we're learning so much. So that's where I go. But um, in general, um, uh, you trust your physician. That's where I would go. Gary, you, you might want to ask Steve this since the question came directly to, to you from one of our coworkers about some concerns that their teenage children have for, for the future. Yeah, I had a great question this morning uh, here that uh, about a coworker's 17-year-old son, and I think about that. You know, before long, uh, ball practices and things will start for school, and those high school students or you know teenagers, at least you know 16, 17-year-olds. Uh, you know, they're concerned uh, uh, about getting the vaccine because, you know, at that age, they're worried about long-term effects. But I also see that's an opportunity when we get all our, our kids back together in school for this to, to flare up again. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Or, or what, what kind of advice would you give to a, either a, a 16 or 17-year-old who's trying to make their own decision or a parent of a, of a teenager trying to make a decision and give their, give their kids some advice? Yeah, I think it's an important calculus to try to look at what you think your risk is from the vaccine compared to your risk um, from uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I think that calculus has changed because the variant is affecting younger people. They're more at risk. And like almost every virus, there are often untold or unknown long-term effects as well. Um, long hauler syndrome, um, those, those sort of worries that may, um, may not come out for decades. Um, and so you've got to balance that risk. I think the school environment, um, unmasked and unvaccinated, um, is extremely dangerous. Um, given that we've, you know, we had four teenagers in the hospital in the last week, um, I'm worried. Um, teenagers tend to have better response, better immune response. There are still risk factors. Um, and so uh, I, I try to do that math. I, I will just tell you that um, my kids are all vaccinated. Um, and uh, Dr. Trotman's kids are all vaccinated, and we didn't do that without great caution and hesitation. As a matter of fact, we, we spoke with the um, pediatric infectious disease expert at St. Louis Children's who has young kids and asked her, what are you doing? And to me, that's about as profound uh, an answer you could get from someone who's in that position who spent their whole life studying this disease. They're vaccinated. It's not without risk. One of the things I would remind people is um, there's a prevalence of side effects in, in a, a population with or without vaccines. So when you hear of maybe a cardiomyopathy, this, this kind of transient cardiomyopathy that some boys have got, compare that to what the prevalence is in the community overall. And what you find is almost every side effect that's shown up, it has a lower prevalence in the vaccine and in the general population, which one could almost argue it might mean the vaccine is preventative. Um, so no vaccine's perfect. It's an important decision to make. Um, uh, but I'll just I'll just tell you that the leading physicians who care about their kids that I know they chose to vaccinate their kids. I think carry that a step further and combine it with a little bit of what you said earlier. We know that there are going to be long-term side effects, um, and we're starting to see some of those. But I think one of the concerns folks have had uh, in, the, in the younger population, or even you know people in 20s and 30s, is uh, potentially the the childbearing years. And is there any discussion on that at this point? Any, uh, it's hard to know since we've only been doing this since March of 20, really. But uh, are yeah. you seeing anything, yeah. findings on that yet, Steve? Yeah, there's been really good data published on that now that uh, gives us the confidence that um, those, those early worries um, haven't been founded. Um, we, we always want to be cautious. We're always worried that children um, tend to be um, different and their response are not just small people, you know, they're, they're a different physiology. Um, our OBGYNs, the American College of GYN, OBGYNs recommend it um, for people of childbearing age. Um, uh, and so um, I, I'm going to lean on their expertise and this published studies that show that those vaccinated aren't having problems with fertility, for example. Um, there was early misinformation. That's something that's really dangerous in this pandemic is there's misinformation. It's not just people getting it wrong. There are people that make money by putting misinformation out there. There are other governments, I believe, that are encouraging misinformation to create discord in our community. So it's hard to sort through that. But if you go to a source like the academies that the specialty physicians come from and they have all their expertise come together to make a recommendation, that's a place I trust. It's not 100%, but it's the best information we have. And in those academies, um, they, they still support uh, getting vaccinated for, for young young women, for example. That's good information to have right there. 
you know, one of the side effects, if you will, of everything that's been going on with um, shortages of, of personnel, uh, people being sick and everything, is you're starting to see uh, this trickle into the ERs and the doctor's offices and everything with extremely long waiting periods and everything. What would you tell some of our employees or anyone really that, that may be having yet another uh, non-COVID related situation medically that they need to have treated? Is there another uh, options that they have, urgent care or anything like that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, some of us, the worried well, we, we think if, if we're not quite sure we go to the ER. And, and I get that. Uh, the ERs throughout the Ozarks are, are very, very full. Um, we have good capacity in our urgent cares and really good pre uh, capacity in our primary care practices. At Cox, for example, we, we have um, a, a thing called Save Your Spot. And so you can go online and go to Save My Spot, and it'll tell you the first available spot in an urgent care. You can plan your day around it. And, you know, I, I took my daughter to one the other day, and um, the first one available was Ozark. It was uh, quicker than I could even get there, so I had to push the spot back a little bit. Um, but that's a really handy tool to kind of help self-triage. Um, and But know that we... We're as, we're as deeply worried about people not getting medical care um, as we are the, the pandemic and the COVID-related issues. So our doctor's offices are generally very available. Um, and um, uh, if you've got the beginning of a worry, um, go to your doctor. Um, uh, try, try not to wait to the ER. Um, and if you go to the ER, know that we have to triage people. We have people, that's what they do for a living, and they make choices. And if you've got symptoms of a stroke, you're going to jump ahead of line of someone who has, um, you know, dermatitis. Um, and so that it may mean that you may wait a long time in the ER. Another reason ER waits are long right now is we're out of capacity in the hospital. So a very sick patient, we, we do what we call board in the ER. Mercy and Cox both are doing this. So a patient may stay in the ER 24 hours waiting for a bed in the hospital. And that means that bed's out of service and the ER makes the lines back up. So good capacity in our urgent cares. Um, we also have a telemedicine, um, which is easy to do. You can do it on your couch um, while you're watching a movie, wait for it to be available. So try all those options before you go to the ER. Um, of course, that's a medical decision. And when in doubt, we, we trust you go to the ER. But um, those places can, can see you pretty quickly, usually. Good advice, sir. Basically, technology has come a long way, and the ER doesn't necessarily have to be your first stop. So. Um, consider everything. Don't take a chance with your life or someone else's, but consider what other options are, are out there is kind of what I'm hearing from that. Um, I go back to yesterday. Governor Parsons uh, is starting to uh, talk more about urging our Missourians and our neighbors to start looking at the vaccine. We're starting to see more and more uh, opportunities within the community. I know Cox and Mercy both have step to the forefront to help with these events. Are, are we starting to see a little bit more interest and do you feel that doing the incentive is starting to help a little bit? I know we're gonna do one with Transit Center here toward the end of July, we'll be talking about more as we get closer to that, but it seems like these vaccination events are on the rise. You know, um, I, I, I feel encouraged. Um, the health department reports back to me just, you know, cause we're all good partners. Um, you know, when the, the Delta variant became kind of national news, um, uh, there was one day they went from a handful of calls to over 100 calls uh, about information about vaccine and scheduling. So that leads me to believe there's increased interest, um, and um, rightfully so, because I think a lot of us looked at the and said, well, I'm young, I'm, I'm healthy. If I get it, I'll be okay. So it's not a big risk. Um, two nights ago, we, we had a 40, one of the young 40s pass away. He was otherwise healthy, you know no issues and um, uh, it's unpredictable now and so as it gets more severe know that um, it's incredibly painful for your family um, you go through this obviously for you and a vaccine can prevent it and I, I can't help but say this um, uh, I have a wonderful life wife uh, and life and um, she uh, as much as I've been involved in healthcare, she makes a lot of healthcare decisions in our family and um, I think um, there's something about a mom looking out for a family and if, if you're a mom, if you're a woman, know that your voice is powerful to the men in your world and um, um, encourage them. Um, sometimes it takes that um, encouragement to get things done. Men, I'm going to stereotype, we're not great about taking care of ourselves from a medical perspective. Um, and um, sometimes it's our wives that make appointments for us and get us scheduled because they care about us. I, I encourage um, all of us, but especially women, you're influential, influence men in your world to get vaccinated. I know. I get 
told what to do quite often. But anyway, that's a different topic. Um, let's take it back to city utilities for just a minute and, and focus on where we stand. We know we're seeing the, the surge. We know we're seeing it in particular areas, Gary. What would the next steps be for the CU workforce if we have to make changes to start preparing for, for a surge throughout uh, the utility a, on a greater speed? Well, you know, everyone has heard me use the term that we are essential workers, and, and those aren't just words. We are essential uh, to this community. I mean, everything that all of you do, uh, the community can't survive without us. I mean, we have to keep the lights on, we have to keep the gas flowing, we have to keep the water, uh, we have to keep people able to get to where they need to go, either to their jobs or medical appointments or groceries through the transit department. And in today's world, we, we know we need to keep SpringNet running so everybody can be connected. And it's not just those people out in the field, it's our support workers because we can't do that without the support either. So we are truly essential. And that's why we have such a great responsibility uh, to make sure that we're there to support all of our neighbors. And so we've seen this Delta variant spread quickly. We've seen it's really nasty. What we've done in power generation is we've gone back to, to the pre-green uh, phase, you know, we call it the red phase, uh, where we're requiring everybody, regardless of whether you've been masked or not, or, or vaccinated or not, to wear a mask. And, and we're using technology and keeping people physically distanced as much as we can. And we'll do the same thing if we see this starting to, to come uh, up in another area. So if we see a case or a case or two, you might think it might be premature, premature, but we have to really make sure we take that seriously. And so if we see a case or two in an area, we will probably go back to, to greater requirements, especially with the masking and social distancing, and then also going back to some of our workforce preservation plans where we kept people apart. And I know it's going to look different from area to area, and I keep thanking everybody for their patience that we've had over the last um, 16, 17 months and the flexibility that everybody has. We still have some field groups who have very low vaccination rates where we haven't come back together in a show up area. And you know what, that's okay. And until we get to those rates and I feel like we can support the community safely, that's what we're going to do. Now I'm asking each VP to, to watch their areas and to develop their own workforce preservation plans, but uh, we have to take this seriously. So again, it's gonna look different from area to area, but you may see us pull the trigger really quickly um, as we see a case or two come up in an area. But hopefully that doesn't happen. So to keep that from happening, to keep you and your coworkers from having to go back to wearing a mask in, in all instances, just make sure you're doing those things that are just common sense that we've learned over the last year and a half. Uh, if you can have a meeting that's on Zoom or, or with Teams, do it. You don't have to get together in a group. If, if you can, uh, especially thinking this weekend coming up, if you're in a group of people that you don't know and you don't know um, what their vaccination situation is or who they've been exposed to, you know, be careful. Consider throwing a mask on. Uh, you know, it's not that big of a deal to wear a mask. It's going to be a really beautiful weekend. It's not going to be real hot. So, uh, you know, I don't see where it's going to be that big of a deal to, to make sure you do the things that are safe and just have common sense because if we do those kind of things it might keep us from having to do some of those things that I know you don't enjoy. I know everybody was really uh, probably encouraged when the city lifted their masking ordinance and we thought we were about to get back to normal but if you remember what I said was there were only two things I knew. One was that on May 28th we weren't magically going to have this thing behind us and number two that I know everybody's not going to comply in every case but as a whole we can really keep each other safe and we can really make sure we're doing the things that we need to do so we don't have to go back to those things that we were doing just a few months ago so uh, again I want to thank everybody for their flexibility and for their patience we're not through this but I think we can get through this as long as we all do the things we need to do. Before we kind of start to wrap up I want to ask you all both of you the million dollar question if you look at it that way. We're seeing a resurgence. We know the vaccination is working to help reduce that surge. But what is it ultimately going to take to drive home the point to everyone the importance of being vaccinated? I mean, uh, all I would say is that um, uh, there's strong opinions and people are judging each other. And um, when there's a lot of misinformation uh, on both sides of the pro and against vaccination, it, lead, it leads people to become paralyzed and take no action when in doubt. And so I, I think judgment's not our position to be in. 
um, giving people grace and understanding is, helping understand why they're hesitant. Um, there's there's going to be some people that just will never get the vaccine, but I think the majority of us um, are hesitant out of caution, out of safety. They want to do the right thing. And so I just encourage all of us that if, if you're working with someone that doesn't doesn't have a vaccine and you want to help them, don't judge. Um, try to understand where their questions are and, and maybe help lead them to answers. Yeah, and I'll follow up on that. I, I love the way that Steve said that because he, he said that a couple different times is, is just show a little bit of grace to each other. You know, we want everybody to feel comfortable here that they come to work and, and be safe. And if that means that even if you've been vaccinated, you want to continue to wear a mask, wear a mask. And I don't want anybody judging you and I don't want anybody to, to judge the other way. But I do want you to have good information and I do want you to be able to make decisions from trusted sources uh, versus uh, just things that, that are floating around out there that may not be true. And so I want you to have the best information. That was really the purpose of today is so that you could have the best information here, definitely from an expert and somebody who's been at the forefront of this like Steve Edwards. And and help that to help you form your own decisions to get through this you know it's going to just take us all working together as a community that's one thing I love about Springfield is that community piece and we seem to come together in a crisis uh, like this to get through it so I'm confident we're going to get through it but I also worry and I don't want it to take the loss of one of our co-workers uh, to be what make somebody finally realize that, hey, I need to take action here uh, and, and do something, whether it is getting a vaccine or, well, it's, or whether it's just taking the steps from wearing a mask or doing other things to keep each other safe. There's no reason with what we've learned over the last year and a half uh, that we have to lose coworkers. Uh, that weighs on me every day. Uh, and I really don't want to have to, to visit with an employee's family or go to a funeral when I know it's absolutely not necessary. And, and I know you don't either. And, and so please work with us and make sure that we get through this and do everything that you can. So I'll just leave it with that. Steve, I'll let you have any closing thoughts and appreciate your time for joining us, by the way. Well, just, just um, Gary said it really well, but you need to understand how we see city utilities here at Cox. You're, they're absolutely fundamental to the, the workings of this city. Um, you've got to protect yourselves because without you, we can't protect our city. I look at you really no different than I do our own employees. Um, it's my job to protect our employees because they're the ones that protect our city. And I feel the exact same way about the, about city utilities. You protect our city by, by keeping power running and keeping the utilities running, keeping communications going. So know that you've got a duty beyond yourself. I, I know that you know that, but your duty also helps us perform our duty. And so we're grateful for that. And again, Steve, I'm just, I know how busy you are, and, and I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to visit with me and, and get this message out to everybody that I get to work with. So I appreciate you. And again, pass on to your teams for everything that they've done to support us over the last year and a half. I will. Thank you, Gary. Steve, thank you for joining us. Gary, thanks as always for your time. And we hope if you have any more questions, you know, contact your supervisor. Uh, contact one of our nurses and ask those questions. But there is good information out there, as Steve has just said. There's a lot of data that shows uh, the very good information on the vac vaccine or the vaccination of, of your choice. So ask those questions. Please consider um, your options on those. Um, above all, take care of each other, and uh, we'll see you next time.